Hey there. Today we have Abe. Is that correctly? Did, did I correctly pronounce your name, Abe? Yeah, that's right. Uh, from DataWire, and we're going to talk about uh, something really cool that you really want to check out if you haven't yet, and that is Telepresence, a tool that every Kubernetes developer should really know and uh, use. So let's start with uh, a bit about yourself. So a bit about your background. Why? Why are you doing? You know, why? Why are you helping <laughs> Kubernetes developers? Sure. Um, well, I, I started out uh, consulting uh, in the finance industry in, in uh, the greater New York area. And I built lots of these sort of internal systems that were all about uh, having pipelines of data flow and, and analysis and moving lot, large amounts of data around in a smart way. And as these systems got more complicated, and I mean, you know, uh, Wall Street does a lot of really complicated computation. Uh, on the trading desks uh, has been for 15 years or whatever. But I noticed that um, it became more and more difficult to keep these these complicated systems uh, running together. I, I guess ultimately I noticed uh, the, the sort of natural tendency towards breaking up the big uh, monolithic pieces of software into smaller pieces. Uh, and when I, when I caught this pattern, I started researching it myself. And then uh, opportunity struck and uh, my, my friend from college, who is a, a data wire CTO, approached me and said, hey, we're starting this uh, firm and we're looking to help developers uh, with microservices. And it all just sort of aligned uh, with what I had been experiencing and it made sense for me to jump on board. Great. Uh, yeah, so I, um, I think we've been uh, focusing on helping developers uh, be more productive and make their lives easier and more natural. And that's, uh, that's always, as as someone who's done the development side of things for a long time, just for uh, other projects, it really appeals to me, our approach of uh, trying to make that process, the process that I think of as my process, smooth and, and easy, even in a complicated microservice sort of space, is uh, it, the whole thing just appeals to me as the way to go. Right, right. And, you know, for the ones who haven't experienced it yet, what is it like to develop applications on top of Kubernetes and microservices, you know, all this? Well, so Kubernetes is, is uh, there's a lot to say there. Kubernetes is, uh, well, okay. My CTL tries to, likes to liken it to a helicopter. It's a really powerful device. Uh, it can do a lot, but it's very, very complicated. And until you get the hang of it, it's, it's very dangerous in a sense. Uh, I mean, essentially, there's a lot of stuff going on, and Kubernetes tries to do a lot of things to make sure. Uh, Kubernetes tries to do a lot of things to to make it so that your workflow is smooth. But if you don't understand what's going on, you'll be surprised again and again. Oh, Kubernetes did that. I didn't understand why it did that. And so the Basically, it boils down to understanding what Kubernetes does, and then you have a great deal of power to, uh, to, to build complicated systems and not have to think about all the details. Once you, once you have reasonable expectations for what's going to happen, then you can work with those, and Kubernetes becomes an incredible accelerator towards uh, keeping things running and getting new things up and uh, all the little, the, the little issues that crop up. So, I guess as a developer, we're, we're um, uh, in, the, in the modern world, we're being tasked with uh, having our service online and making sure it stays online, right? So the, the traditional split of developers writing code and then ops keeping it running, that's sort of going away. And by allowing developers to have the uh, agency to make that possible, it's not just about dumping responsibility on the developer, it's also about giving the developer agency to, to, to make that happen. Uh, there's a lot of complicated new stuff that developers have to do. And Kubernetes uh, makes that a lot simpler by uh, giving you the tools to, to um, let's say, declaratively treat the state of, of your deployment of your system as, you, uh, uh, as a thing that you can say, this is how I want stuff to be, and Kubernetes sort of makes it happen. And once you understand the details of what Kubernetes will do, you start to make the world a certain way, 
once you get that internalized, then Kubernetes is fantastically useful and makes things very easy. And until that point, you can run into all sorts of trouble. Right. So, so if, I, if I understand that correctly, like you're arguing that it's, it's quite a learning curve and, and with your tooling, trying to help developers to you know be faster and more productive or is that a fair characterization or? Yes, there's a, there's a high learning curve, um, but it's associated with a lot of power. Uh, the productivity gains uh, can be can be fantastic once uh, once your your team has let's say internalized a, a reasonable workflow for working with Kubernetes. I mean, when you get started, you're you're talking about all of these new concepts, services, and deployments, and pods, and so on and so forth, and it sort of feels like you're mucking around with lots of little YAML files, and uh, it's not always in initially clear like should we just cargo cult this YAML file and just change the bits we need to change and push that out? Or should we take the time to understand it all? And I think over time, as you work with this stuff, uh, the, the, you, you get a, a handle on what's really important. Most of the time you care about deployments and making sure your services point to the right place. And then the other stuff only comes up when you have to do nitty gritty details or you're changing the shape of your individual services in some way. Um, and then you start writing templates for your YAML and you, and you get a, a set of, uh, let's say, constructs that you can reuse uh, and you understand what they do in Kubernetes for you. And it all becomes very smooth and quick over time. Right. And I mean, we, we're um, building tooling around this stuff too, so. Right, right. Coming back to tooling, so uh, telepresence in, in, is special. Um, how would you, you know, an elevator pitch for telepresence? What what does it do? How, how does it help developers? Well, telepresence lets you uh, place your, uh, let's say, your development laptop, whatever it is you're sitting in front of coding, uh, effectively place that in the Kubernetes cluster uh, at, at, in a, in a virtual sense, such that you can run your code. Uh, in your development environment with your debugger or however you want to do it, uh, but it will act as if it's running in the Kubernetes cluster. And this is uh, a powerful way for you to uh, develop your service or debug your service uh, without having to deal with the standard uh, deployment cycle associated with Kubernetes. Uh, so, so perhaps I should talk about that a bit, the standard yeah, development yeah. cycle. Okay. Let us dive um, into that a little bit more, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, the normal process uh, with a with setting up a, a new deployment or a new service in Kubernetes is uh, you have your piece of code and you need to put it into a, a Docker image. You, you uh, bake a Docker image for, for this piece of code and you push that up into a, uh, uh, a repository so that the so that Kubernetes can then pull that down into the cluster. And then you need to update your uh, YAML files associated with that deployment so that Kubernetes knows to get the latest version. And then Kubernetes goes and does its thing, which basically means bringing up the new version, shutting down the old version uh, if the new version comes up, if it doesn't fall down. And uh, this whole process is not necessarily slow or long, but there is definitely a process there. And, and if you start out doing it all manually, you know, Docker build, uh, edit your YAML file, uh, kube control apply, et cetera, it, it, it can take a while. And, and we've built a tool called Forge that uh, automates a lot of that so that you can, um, I mean, you, you can imagine writing a script that does these commands. So Forge is sort of a, a very smart, powerful script that, um, it takes care of writing those scripts for you, which uh, doesn't try to, you know, take over your process or whatever. But in any case, so Forge is a way to to speed up that cycle. But the ultimately, there is a cycle there. There is some amount of latency between you make your code change and you have it running in the cluster. So Telepresence lets you sidestep all of that. With Telepresence, uh, as soon as you can run your code on your own machine, uh, you can run it in Kubernetes. It is uh, literally one and the same thing. So if you're uh, writing, say you're writing code in Kotlin, 
and you have um, your IDE running, uh, which I guess would be uh, uh, IntelliJ, right? Uh, you have your Kotlin code in IntelliJ, and you hit the compile key, uh, sorry, the run key, and now your code is running. Uh, with telepresence, you can make that be in the cluster right away. You don't have to right. deal with the bake cycle, the push up to the repository, and then the pull down from the right. and all that good stuff. Uh, right. If you're using uh, a language like Python or Ruby, where there's not even a compile step, uh, for example, if you're writing your application in Flask or in, in, in uh, Express, you can literally edit your code and the running application will update itself and immediately show you the newest results. Uh, with Telepresence, that's how quickly your service development can go. You can have almost an interactive feel with developing your service because Telepresence makes your, your local development environment appear like it's in the cluster. Right, and there are essentially like two directions, right? Like you want to call other microservices in the, that sure. run in the cluster already, and you want to be, be able to be called like you as in your service from other uh, services that run in the cluster. And Telepresence supports both ways. That's right. So so consider uh, your, your um, organization has a Kubernetes cluster and a, an application that is uh, running in Kubernetes, and you're writing a brand new service. So in that stage one of writing the service, all you really care about is being able to run your code, but access the services that are already there, access maybe cloud systems like Amazon RDS or, or Google Bigtable, something like that, that your application might want to use. And um, so uh, Telepresence takes care of that for you by effectively putting your machine in the Kubernetes cluster in a sort of outbound uh, direction. Now, over time, you, you develop your um, service, you deploy it, and it's running, and you find a bug, or you, or you discover that you need to add a new feature. But now that your service is out there, other things are going to be accessing you as well, right? This is not a brand new service anymore. This is something that's in production. So now you need both directions of Telepresence's prox proxying feature. Uh, so when you run Telepresence and you swap that deployment out, and it's now running on your local machine, other services that are out there will hit, this, uh, hit the, the Kubernetes service, and that will go to the Telepresence uh, pod that will come down to your local machine. So effectively, uh, all of the services that are in your cluster that are accessing your service will continue to do so even as that service is running on your laptop. Right. So it's really a first-class citizen in terms of FQDN. The DNS works as normal. You can just access it from other services. You as a developer don't really see a difference. And at some point in time, you're gonna switch over to the you know traditional model, at, you know building the the image. Or what, what's your recommendation? What's your flow there? How do you? Well, well, ultimately uh, you don't want to. Uh, ultimately, you don't want to keep running your application on your development box, right? So. Uh, once you're once you're satisfied that things uh, appear to be correct as you want them, you've done your git commit and your push and so forth. Uh, you'll you'll do your forge deploy or whatever your your deployment system is, and uh, so you'll you'll bake that Docker image. You'll put it into the repository. You now have this immutable blob that uh, represents the current state of your service at this particular version, and uh, you will deploy it into into mm -hmm. staging and then ultimately into production, and it will run in Kubernetes. So telepresence is not there to be part of your production system. It, it, I mean, sure, if you have this uh, crazy, the world is burning situation, maybe you'll use telepresence to get into production <laughs> and, and, and do some, some very, very temporary, short-term nasty things. But in general, telepresence is there to help you as a developer uh, build your system, improve your, your, your service, uh, debug your service, basically make your development process be uh, quick and interactive as it would be for uh, something that wasn't a service running in a Kubernetes cluster. Got it. So in, in a sense, it's uh, the proxying is the new SSH into the production server. You can uh, at any point in time access it and uh, do crazy things, but you essentially should only be doing it for development and maybe troubleshooting, but not really. Um, so once you're satisfied, right. you kind of like bake the image and then really deploy it through other means. And certainly, um, I think it's fair to say that. 
Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. I was going to say, um, so so with the uh, Kubernetes lets you do things like uh, canary deployments and things like that, splitting traffic between multiple versions, uh, especially if you use uh, service mesh tools like Istio or, or Envoy sidecars or uh, things of that nature, let you do some advanced routing stuff where you could set things up such that most of the, the users of your service get the version that's running in Kubernetes, but a small fraction of them get the version that's running on your laptop through telepresence. So it's, it's very reasonable to try to uh, take a running system and debug it using telepresence by stepping through uh, the your code in your in your debugger, um, setting breakpoints and things like that. As long as you understand uh, that some portion of your traffic is going to be very very much slowed down when you do this, because obviously when you stop at a breakpoint, you're stopped and you're not returning an answer. But right. but I mean in a staging system or or with the right type of uh, um, redirection setup. For example, you can give your, your test user a special um, cookie or a special HTTP header and set up your routing system, like Envoy can right. do this, to only send to the, the test version of, of a particular deployment uh, if you have that header set, something along those lines. So you can carefully control what traffic you're debugging uh, and, and then use telepresence to get that debugging info right in front right. of you in your own IDE. Right. So what I was about to say or ask you is, is it fair to say that it's telepresence is not only useful if you have like a, a real life cluster somewhere in the cloud or on premises, whatever, but even if you run, you know, Minikube or Minishift on your uh, local machine, uh, it's still, you know, you kind of shortcut this, you know, building image, deploying it, pulling it and so on. You, you still benefit from that, even if you're kind of your cluster is on your machine. Uh, absolutely. So uh, with something like uh, Minikube or, or Minishift, you have the option to uh, Docker build using the the uh, the Docker that's running in the Minikube. So you can avoid the one step. You can avoid uh, pushing out to the repository so that Kubernetes can then pull it down. So you reduce the latency a little bit. But that said, it's still far more interactive. I mean, again, the the ability to be able to literally edit your code and hit save and then try to access the service and, and see immediately the new results is just, right. it's beyond uh, going right. through that process. Um, right. and, and I think I think using telepresence and developing in, in Minikube is, is a great thing to do if you're on a plane and you don't have good connectivity, or if you're starting out with Kubernetes and you want to understand what's going on and really see what happens if you crank up too many things in the cluster or, or start killing things willy-nilly or whatever. It's a great right. um, exploration tool. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it has its own drawbacks, right? Minikube doesn't work quite the same way as uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, does in, in uh, cloud providers or likely how it would be provisioned uh, right. on-prem. So, so yeah, there's a bit of a trade-off there, but telepresence is certainly still very useful in that case. Right. Talking about like we had a couple of use cases now, and I think everyone gets it that you know if you're serious about developing on on, on Kubernetes, then you need you know telepresence to to really uh, be be very uh, uh, agile and and uh, the, having a high developing velocity there. Um, can you talk a bit about like limitations or like stuff that people should be aware of that you know managing expectations that they know like this won't work or you have to make sure that a certain communities version of, of whatever the requirements or, or limitations might be sure well well let's talk about how uh telepresence works because mm -hmm. uh that's ultimately where the limitations come in um telepresence is trying to do something that isn't natural for kubernetes right kubernetes uh typically uh, controls its hardware, its nodes, and and controls the the pods or the 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 various the sets of Docker containers that are running uh, inside it, and so it's it's very well designed for that purpose. Uh, what Telepresence does is uh, deploy a pod into Kubernetes that then pretends to be the service that you're running on your own machine. Right. So some some aspects of this work perfectly. The pod that's running in Kubernetes has access to uh, 
all of the, the configuration, the config maps and the secrets, the, the environment variables in the file system. And it can, it can uh, uh, telepresence can uh, copy those over to your local machine uh, without any trouble. Mm -hmm. Other aspects of things are a little more complicated. So uh, there are three ways that uh, telepresence works right now. If your code naturally runs in a Docker container, then, uh, then you want to use the container method. And uh, what that means is telepresence will manipulate your Docker container running on your local machine uh, to set up its networking uh, such that it appears to be running inside Kubernetes. Right. Uh, but I think the more common case is that your code is running directly on your local machine, like you're using your debugger and you hit, hit the go button, uh, or, you're, or you're running your Express or your, or your Flask service. And so for that, we have two me methods. Uh, there's inject TCP, which uses uh, uh, overriding the, the, uh, the linked libraries that go with your executables uh, to intercept the network traffic and the DNS traffic. And then there's uh, VPN, uh, the uh, prox proxy VPN. So what we're trying to do there is set up a, a, a VPN-like system where all network traffic uh, is captured and then the right subset of it is sent to the Kubernetes cluster. So in either case, we have limitations. With the, the, uh, the library-based uh, injection of code, uh, you run into issues where if your library is completely statically linked, sorry, if your executable is completely statically linked, for example, most Go code, Go. <laughs> uh, then you cannot inject a library into it because it's not right. trying to load any libraries. Right. Um, and certain commands, uh, especially operating system commands like ping, they don't follow the normal path of, uh, of network connectivity. So those, those things won't work. But right. I mean, if you're developing an application, this is not a major limitation most of the time. Now, Go, Go is rough because lots of people love Go for, for writing microservices. It's a fantastic language for that. Yeah. And um, so you're sort of stuck using uh, not the preferred tool chain, using GCC Go and, uh, or, or having it use the, the C library approach to doing networking rather than the, the high, highly optimized Go specific stuff. Right. But um, for most other things, if you're talking about C code, Java code, Python, Ruby, Node, et cetera, uh, you're, you're pretty good. Uh, a few, we, we run into a few other issues specifically on Mac OS because mm -hmm. of system integrity protection. Mm -hmm. uh, and that basically says uh, this injection of code uh, uh, through the library mechanism doesn't work for any binary that's uh, under system integrity protection. And so, yes, your code is not going to be under that. But if you happen to run your code through a shell script, the shell is protected. And so that, the, that injection gets lost. And by the time we start executing your code, the injection is already gone. So right. again, there's ways around this. And, and Telepresence sort of tries to work around this. But if you have a hard-coded uh, slash bin slash sh or a slash user slash bin slash n mm -hmm. in, your, in your script, you're stuck. So right. these uh, these things are are sort of unavoidable. Apple works very hard to protect its users, and hmm. uh, it's you know it's a trade off right. like many other things. So what I now, hear essentially is that sorry, go ahead. Uh, now the the other approach is the VPN approach, uh, mm -hmm. and that avoids uh, messing around with your binaries, uh, mm -hmm. and instead uh, operates at the the system level. So it captures all the traffic on your laptop, uh, including your web browser and so forth, that you might be doing other stuff with. Now, it selectively only forwards the packets that are relevant by looking at their destination IP addresses. So it has to figure out Kubernetes is over here in this space. Maybe it's 10.0 slash 16 or whatever um, block of address it is. Uh, addresses are apparently pointing to Kubernetes. And then it, it captures and, and forwards just those. And, uh, generally speaking, that works great. The one limitation right now is that you can only run one VPN at a time. So if you need to use a VPN for your own purposes, right. you can't run telepresence uh, in this yeah. mode at the same time. Right. And similarly, because 
the proxying is all one piece, as in mm -hmm. you're replacing one deployment in the cluster with uh, your own uh, with with telepresence. You can't with VPN mode. You can't run telepresence more than once simultaneously. So you can't proxy two different deployments simultaneously. Uh, okay. Whereas with the other mechanism, you can. Now this is something I'm working towards uh, uh, improving in the future. Right, right. We get we come back to that to future steps. Yep. But let's stay for yep. for a moment just here. Just just wrap up uh, essentially that part. So essentially, what I hear is yes. pretty much all languages uh, oh, you, you have no problem. I'm yeah. sorry, I I lost you for a few moments. I may have might have had a, a blip in my networking. Could you say that last part again, please? Yeah. So essentially wrapping up um, this this part in terms of languages, um, all the languages uh, are supported, and for some languages or, or systems like essentially Go, statically linked, uh, you need to do a bit of some workarounds, apply some workarounds, uh, or macOS, which has certain other um, security requirements, but but there are always like workarounds that make it possible for everyone to actually benefit from. Telepresence. So there's there is no like you cannot use this language just for certain languages. You need to use some workarounds essentially, or right yeah, certain systems. Um, and one thing before we get to the future part, um, in terms of since we are at security, uh, quite often we see issues with you know especially since we have uh, Arbic now and, and vanilla Kubernetes uh, 1.6. Um, are there? Did you see any issues around, you know, people with with uh, using RBAC and or as e Linux, so you know, any kind of security related access control or whatever otherwise uh, settings? Well, uh, you you bring up two very tough topics actually. So <laughs> so with regards to se Linux, um, yeah. we we've noticed that it's definitely possible for se Linux to to basically keep telepresence from working entirely, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll be honest, I've largely uh, sidestepped that issue for the moment. Uh, I'm I'm testing on a uh, sort of a default Fedora install and a, on a default uh, Ubuntu install. And I haven't run into issues there specifically. And I'm, I'm looking towards uh, users uh, getting back to me and, and filing bugs or, or whatever the case may be when they run into issues so I can address them one at a time. Because Cool. SE Linux is a huge topic, and I, I will fully admit I do not have my brain wrapped around that just yet. So we'll see we'll see how that goes. But so far, uh, at least with the the standard configurations, it hasn't been an issue. Uh, with with the role based access control, um, I think what we've seen so far is uh, users are using telepresence with their their staging setups or with their mini kubes or or uh, things of that nature. Uh, smaller, uh, sorry, non-production clusters where perhaps uh, we've not we've not run into this yet. So there's definitely experiments I have in mind. I want to see what happens and how uh, telepresence can fail. Um, I think the thing we have going for us here is that. As long as the developer has the ability to deploy the the uh, service, the code that they are working on, they're going to have the same capability to deploy what Telepresence does. Telepresence is not messing around with the cluster as a whole. It is only working within that pod. So I, yeah. I believe we should be fine. Uh, but I have to admit, I have not uh, pressed against it just yet. Right, right, right. So I, you know, I did not intend to put you on the spot here. It's really just, sure. really this expectation management that people know. You know, if 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 they would need to disable SE Linux, that's fair. Or if they, you know, oh, be careful. You need to have these and these uh, elevated permissions for for you know RBAC settings or whatever. I think you know, since there is, let's be honest, there is no alternative to telepresence. That's it's the only tool in that space. So it's just fair to say, you know, if there is something people should be aware of. Um, be aware of, but as far as I understand, um, more testing is needed. So we need uh, the community to get back to you and say, "Hey, I am running into this and this issue." But so far, essentially, you um, haven't run into into bigger issues there. Exactly. Um, so so far, I haven't run into it, uh, and I look forward to uh, having specific use cases that need need solving uh, that I will happily look into and try to. 
I, I mean, let's be honest. Oh, you have to disable SE Linux is a, is not a great answer. It's never <laughs> a great answer. So I'm, sure. I'm hoping that we can come up with uh, maybe a, a a more pointed solution uh, if if uh, problems arise. Right. So. And, yep. and is there like you know there are like um, managed environments like uh, Google Container Engine or OpenShift uh, Online where maybe a user doesn't really like even have the privileges or whatever? Is there anything that you know you need to be aware of? Does it need anything any elevated privileges in, in the cluster to run, or is, can I just you know use it with any kind of cluster? Uh, you should be fine with any kind of cluster as long as you have the ability to deploy that, uh, well, basically, if you can deploy your code, if you can create a deployment that runs your code using mm -hmm. your image, then uh, you should be able to uh, use Telepresence to deploy its code. Now, Telepresence's um, uh, Docker images are, are in, um, I think we're using, goodness, are we using Quay? I actually forgot. We're, we're, they're, they're in the public cloud, so, so as long as you can pull that down, right. you're fine. If you're if you're okay. firewalled off, it may get slightly more complicated. You'll have to replicate uh, the the telepresence uh, Docker image into your private repository right. or whatever. But uh, right. no one has brought that up yet, so I'm okay, so curious to see if we run into that. That's actually a good point. So if you are behind a firewall where you can't pull from whatever public registry you're using, you can still benefit from it. You just would need to take these images and, and serve them via your own on-site, on-premises, or whatever uh, registry. That's right. still work. OK, cool. That's awesome. Right. Um, yeah. Let's move on to the future. What's uh, you know not necessarily only telepresence. Uh, you, you mentioned already a few things uh, in terms of improving, and definitely you're, you're seeking feedback and, and more use cases from the community and testing. But you know, right. where, where is that whole thing heading? What's, what's next uh, for telepresence or other uh, developer support tools in uh, DataWire? Well, uh, on the telepresence front, um, we started out with telepresence by, by addressing particular use cases. Uh, uh, for example, I want to develop a brand new microservice, and I want to be able to talk to the cluster, talk to the services in the cluster. So for that, we, we had to make sure that your local uh, the local instance of your service that's running on your machine can talk to the cluster, right? We need to proxy connections from your machine to the cluster, right? And we we solved that. And then there was another use case of we need to be able to access uh, services that are out there. We need to be able to access the secrets and the configuration that's out there. And so that uh, is is where we brought in the this proxying of stuff from the cluster down to your uh, machine. Okay. And we, we sort of wrote these things as the use cases came up, and uh, it works great for those use cases. But we've discovered that people want to do more. And right. uh, it, at this point, it's starting to make sense to sort of separate out the pieces of what telepresence does and let right. users access those pieces individually. So. There's kind of three pieces, really. There is network from your laptop to the cluster. Yeah. Uh, and that's the sort of thing where I feel like someone who works on an, a, a Kubernetes application could kind of leave that running all the time. There's really little reason not to have that running, unless your cluster has services that have names that conflict with other things you use regularly. Uh, why not just be constantly connected to the cluster uh, using this telepresence channel? Uh, then there's bringing stuff from the cluster down to your machine, right? Now, at the moment, if you're using inject, you, inject TCP, you can do that with multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, deployments. But if you're using the VPN approach, you can't do that. Right. So, we're uh, we're talking about how we could possibly separate those two pieces so that telepresence can put multiple deployments out there and uh, collect connections and bring them all down to your local machine uh, independently of the the portion of the VPN that's responsible for pushing a data up to the cluster. And so that would allow you to replace to use the VPN methodology, but uh, replace multiple deployments. 
The third piece is uh, perhaps the simplest one where you need to have a deployment in the cluster to access configuration and secrets. So again, we run into the situation where we want to be able to do multiple uh, deployments, but we don't want to run into this issue of having to uh, use all sorts of workarounds for Go binaries and static mm. and stuff and this and that. Right, right. So, so I'm, I'm trying to fit, uh, brainstorm up with the team how we can separate these three things, still, still offer a reasonable user experience. We don't want this crazy, complicated command line uh, so we're we're working on it, and uh, we hope to end up in a place where, it, as a as a Kubernetes developer, you can reasonably swap out uh, as many deployments as you want uh, to have them all running on your own machine if you need to. Uh, you can redirect services to point to your machine rather than uh, having to create multiple deployments, and then you can access all of the the usual uh, file system type stuff and environment type stuff that you can get. Uh, in in uh, Kubernetes, okay, uh, but so, we're still a ways out from that. <laughs> so, uh, telepresence is open source, and I yes. assume you're open to patches or someone. Absolutely. Uh, so, so we sure are it's... on telepresence.io is our right. website. Uh, our documentation is there, and uh, we're on GitHub. So it's uh, datawire slash telepresence, and it's linked from telepresence.io. And uh, we are very happy to receive issues and pull requests are, of course, uh, always welcome. And um, we're particularly interested in, in hearing about how you use telepresence because, as I said, that is how we develop the feature set that's already there. We want right. to know what you're trying to do so that we can help you do it. Is there somewhere like a road mapping se uh, section or something where people can see what you plan for the new future or anything like I'd that? Or? Uh, so, so I believe we have. No, I take that back. I don't believe we have a, mo a roadmap on the okay. site at the moment. So, so to be to be clear, uh, I took over development of Telepresence from mm -hmm. the original developer uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, I'm basically running down his his set of uh, uh, of suggested changes because he's brilliant right. and he made Telepresence and it's amazing, uh, right. and I'm trying to. Do the things that he suggested first because he is mm -hmm. more aware of the community than I am. But uh, as as that process winds down, I, I agree it makes sense for us to start writing down what we want to do next and having that yes. up there and, and uh, requesting okay. uh, feedback and comments. Awesome. And yeah, how do people you. reach you via via Twitter or how, how do people uh, it's best reach you? The email is probably the best way to go. Uh, okay, that we, be, we include uh, that in with you. Okay, r3 at datawire.io, <laughs> yep. One last question um, around the, the um, you know, future, whatever, of, of mm -hmm. telepresence or other related tools. Is there anything in the, you know, in a SIG, in a special uh, interest group or wider communities, uh, community where you, you know, want to submit it or to bring it in a, in a standardized form or do you want to keep it uh, in your space? What, is there any, are there any plans or just out of interest? Uh, let me see if, uh, let me, let me answer and you tell me whether I understood the question. Right. Uh, right. So, so DataWire is involved in the cloud native uh, compute uh, foundation uh, right. and we are uh, regularly, we present at uh, Kubernetes, uh, the community meetups. Uh, com the community meetups, uh, KubeConf and things like that coming up. Uh, we have some stuff going on, and uh, if you know, if if you can help us uh, talk about telepresence elsewhere, we'd love to talk about it, right. and uh, as well as Forge and uh, all the other great stuff we're doing, Ambassador. Right. Uh, so we'd love to uh, get the word out. Right. Uh, as far sure. as development. Of telepresence goes uh, again. We we develop openly in GitHub, uh, and uh, uh, we are happy to uh, hear from the community and and uh, go where you need us to go. So I guess if there is a Kubernetes meetup or cloud native meetup somewhere out there, and people would love to you know have you speak there, that might be possible if the if the distance Absolutely. works out. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, uh, we also hang out on uh, Kubernetes Slack. In the uh, SIG apps uh, cool. channel, and so uh, well, not just there, but there specifically, uh, 
uh, telepresence does come up from time to time, and we try to answer questions there. Perfect. That's a great place for people to, yeah, reach out to you and, and start start out the question and and giving feedback. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks a lot for your time. Um, that was great. And um, yeah, let's hope that uh, you know, seen it's it's available for OpenShift, and I'm a big big user and, and fan myself. That uh, this uh, the word spreads, and then you get even more feedback and more users. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot yeah, for your thank time. You. Thank you very much.